African-Americans, so we do things like call and response and engage very differently. So greetings, everyone. My name is Ajawa, uh, and it is truly an honor and a pleasure to share this time and space with you all. Uh, before I begin my brief remarks, I must first thank the Board of Trustees, uh, the museum's leadership, and especially Milani Douglas, uh, for your commitment to ensuring that diverse voices and perspectives are in fact represented here. I only have a few minutes to speak. Uh, and as a forever student of history who is uh, committed to empowering and marginalized, uh, empowering and mobilizing marginalized communities for collective political action, I want to spend just a little bit of time highlighting some of the uh, lesser known truths about the suffrage movement, and more specifically, that well known suffrage march of 1913. Next year, many white women will celebrate nationwide, undoubtedly, uh, the 100 years uh, of having the right to vote. But we know that 1920 does not mean the same thing to black women. It's a reminder that although black women, being the pragmatic activists that we were and still are, who understood the concept of intersectionality before the term was even coined, that we sacrificed for a democracy that did not even include us. You'll note here uh, this picture on the left of Mary McLeod Bethune uh, in her younger years and an interpretation by Charles White of her last will and testament. I will leave the full interpretation up to you because that is the beauty of art but it symbolizes a piece that she wrote before she transitioned, uh, essentially that stated, uh, I leave you love and I leave you hope. Uh, it was commissioned in 1978 by the city of Los Angeles. Uh, on the right, you will see a picture of my colleague, Rhonda Briggins, who is the national co-chair of the National Social Action Commission uh, for Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated and the national president for uh, the sorority as well, in addition to, of course, First Lady uh, Michelle Obama. Uh, it speaks to our uh, intergenerational approach to activism. Uh, this piece here has a baby, of course, and to the left is her father, and to the right is her mother. So again, there has to be an intergenerational approach towards activism in order for it to work in the way that it should. You'll see here uh, some of our invaluable activists pictured. Uh, so of course there is Fannie Lou Hamer, who of course put it all on the line, Ella Baker all the way to the right, uh, and to her immediate left is Eleanor Norton Holmes, and then of course you have Stokely Carmichael uh, in the back as well. This one was taken on the steps of the Democratic National Convention in 1964 when they spoke out. Fannie Lou Hamer actually uh, testified at the Rules Committee um, when they wouldn't seek the intergenerational uh, delegation from Mississippi called the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. Uh, I included this photo because of the interconnectedness of the overall struggle. Void of situating activism in its proper context, historical context, we can't have any real meaningful conversation about the suffrage movement, especially without pointing to the mere contradiction of it all. And because I mentioned context, I should probably note that this year marks the 400th year of black people's forced removal from the continent of Africa. They endured uh, an unconscionable middle passage known as the African Holocaust, um, and was, they were dehumanized in ways that people can't even begin to understand. So, uh, it is impossible for many black women to share in the celebration and excitement when we are here still fighting for those rights uh, that others will in fact celebrate. And we are fighting against an anti-woman, anti-black, anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim, uh, uh, you name it. Uh, we are fighting against an administration that does not value anything or anyone that is not white male, wealthy, and privileged. This picture here of Minty Ross, or Moses, or Harriet Tubman, as, as some of you uh, may know her as, 
who passed away in March of 1913, was chosen because she's so critically important uh, to acknowledge for her foundational work regarding black women and the fight for freedom. This photo was recently discovered and is in the collection at the Library of Congress and is shared by the National Museum of African American History and Culture where it is currently prominently displayed. Uh, I love it because this is the only one that I've seen of her where she was actually the age that she was doing the work that we all know about. Uh, she, just a, a quick note, she passed away two months after Rosa Parks was actually born. So while she didn't get a chance to actually see her in action, she was actually alive at the time that the next generation was born. Um, just to sort of, you know, read through this very quickly, and I know I have very limited time, that 13th Amendment abolished enslavement and involuntary servitude except uh, if convicted of a crime. The 14th Amendment establishes due process and equal protection under the law. The Citizenship Amendment is what it is known as. Section 2 empowers what becomes the Civil Rights Act of 1957 and again 1964. The 15th Amendment, uh, voting protected under unconstitutional restrictions. I will read that again because it's critically important to note. That amendment protected uh, the vote against any unconstitutional restrictions. Section two of that empowers um, what becomes the Voting Rights Act of 1965. As the non-lawyer, uh, to put this simply, section one says what our rights are, uh, and section two says Congress has the power to pass laws that help enforce our rights outlined in section one. The Civil Rights Movement was essentially about getting Congress to use section two to enforce our rights as outlined in section one. That's why the Civil Rights Movement is referred to, at least in my circles, uh, as the Second Reconstruction. Between the legal uh, end of enslavement and government-sanctioned oppression known as Jim Crow uh, is that Reconstruction period when the Constitution was amended three times. And the reason we call it the first Reconstruction is because 100 years later, black people had to go and force this country essentially to realize the promise of the Reconstruction Amendments which essentially didn't mean anything. I should note uh, that the 15th Amendment should have resulted in uh, voting rights. If you read it, there is no reference to gender. So it was a flawed interpretation of that that even called for the 19th Amendment. The 15th Amendment is when we should have all had our rights. Sojourner Truth, um, Sojourner Truth uh, was chosen for very obvious reasons as well. Um, again, intersectionality was something that black women had to deal with from our arrival here in this country. The suffrage movement was not welcoming to black women. The famous parade in March of 1913 was deemed a march for white women. And when the founders of the newly established Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated conveyed their desire and intent to participate, uh, that caused major issues. The entire movement was almost compromised because of racism. The same women fighting for their rights didn't see them in connection to ours. There was widespread concern by that having the Negro women participate, their efforts would somehow be compromised. Susan B. Anthony is no hero uh, in the eyes of some black women, and that's acknowledging that she was in fact friends with Sojourner Truth, as well as Frederick Douglass, uh, but she ultimately chose whiteness over solidarity with black women. History tells us she wasn't a blatant racist, but she did later ask Frederick Douglass to not come to Atlanta in 1895. The solidarity thing was and still is very complicated. She petitioned lawmakers essentially to give voting rights to their wives and daughters before they gave them to black people. My founders who I referenced were young Howard University students. They were committed to social action, they were brave, they were unwelcomed, they were antagonized, and they were unsafe. But they were in fact there in that march in 1913. Uh, as the only black women organization to do so. Their first public act as a sorority was in fact one of protest right here in our nation's capital. 
They understood that progress was part of the process and in pushing for gender equality, they were at the same time pushing for racial equality. Here I'll just note that fact that there is space for everyone um, to work for progress. There are two leaders who are referenced here, both Ida B. Wells and Mary Church Terrell, uh, with two different strategies. I like to refer to Ida B. Wells as sort of a fire breather. Uh, she didn't make any compromises. Uh, when she came to the suffrage march, they actually asked for her to go in the back, and she said no. The Illinois delegation is who sent me here, the Alpha chapter, uh, the Alpha Club of the suffrage uh, march, I mean, movement, excuse me. Um, she said that's who sent me, so that's who I will be marching with, and she actually marched with her delegation. Uh, Mary Church Terrell, uh, however, agreed to participate under these segregated uh, conditions. I would probably self-identify as more of an Ida B. Wells type, but there is something to be said about the multiple ways that we go about accomplishing the same goal. Uh, again, the 19th Amendment should not have been necessary whatsoever. It was the 15th Amendment that granted us the right to vote in theory. Um, and so I just need to at least acknowledge these women for their roles in leading that fight. Here, uh, you'll see the founders of Delta Sigma Theta sorority uh, pictured to the left uh, on the top. Again, they were the only black women at, who marched as an actual organization. And so they're pictured here not because I am a member of the organization, but because of their role in the actual movement. You'll see me and my sorority sisters, again, to the right and at the top, because again, we understand that you must also fight for other people's rights. So that is us participating in the March for Our Lives, uh, essentially uh, advocating for children to not be uh, separated from their families. And then lastly, you will see uh, Congresswoman Marsha Fudge, who once led Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated as the national president, uh, serving in her capacity as chair of the House Administration uh, Subcommittee on Elections, uh, and she is still leading the way where protecting our rights to vote are concern, is concerned. Uh, and this year alone, she has traveled across the country uh, through multiple states and held hearings about voting rights and their abuses for the purpose of determining fixes uh, and eradicating voter suppression. I will say this as I prepare to sit down and, and let my next esteemed uh, colleague take over. Um, I am not sure if the uh, revolution will be televised. What I do know, however, is that it must in fact be funded and that artists will in fact play a very critical role in capturing it. So I am asking for you all to continue to support this museum um, and all of the great work that they do. And again, Lonnie, thank you so much for having me and ensuring again that these perspectives are in fact diverse. Everybody. All right, I am so happy to be here. I know it's still the afternoon, but it doesn't feel like it. So I want to say tonight, I'm very grateful to be in this beautiful and inspiring space. Um, I'm going to spend my time today really talking to you about the art of activism. So first, let me say, my name is Jackie Payne. I'm the founder and executive director of Galvanize USA. We support women to build the political knowledge, confidence, and agency to use their power to advance progress for all. This statistic really changed my life. Um, do you recognize it from the 2016 election? For many of us who have spent our lives working on gender, racial, and economic justice, this statistic was devastating. Not because the majority of white women voted for a Republican, because I want, number one, the majority of us have voted for a Republican every time since 1952 except twice, and not because it was a Republican. This isn't about a partisanship but because the majority of white women voters embraced a candidate who told us that his beliefs and policies would be racist, anti-woman, anti-immigrant. And that peddling in division and othering was um, game-changing for me. 
particularly because given the size and demog demographic distribution of the white electorate, the reality is that as long as white women join the vast majority of white men in continuing to uphold the status quo, it will literally be generations before we can pass and sustain all of these issues that we're working on, choice, gun safety, climate change, racial justice. Since 2016, our country has continued to pull apart the seams. We have seen increased polarization, increased partisanship, increased tribalism, hate crimes are up, faith in government, the media and institutions are down. The gap between the rich and the poor is at an all-time high. Between automation and demographic shifts, our world is changing rapidly, and folks do not feel seen, heard, or taken care of. So what are we doing in response to this political moment? I saw just uh, two days ago, we're pouring hundreds of millions more dollars into political ads for 2020. Folks on both sides are pulling out their old playbooks, honestly, mostly designed by white men, and trying to craft the most impactful messages to persuade folks to vote their way, and they're just flooding TV and social media with them. But this moment demands something more of us, both for the short term, as we think about how to effectively engage folks for 2020, and for the longer term, because no matter who wins, we are still a country on the brink of civil war. So tonight, I want to talk to you about a different way, and that's really the art of deep canvassing. I think of it as an art because just like art, deep canvassing has the magical ability of opening hearts and minds. Deep canvassing creates the conditions for folks to let down their guard, connect with someone else who they, is a stranger to them, reflect on their values, work through their dissonance, and ultimately arrive at a new place that feels authentic and right to them. That's why it works. Here's the architecture of deep canvassing. You may be familiar with the term from um, the fight for marriage equality. I was trained in deep canvassing by some amazing advocates at Planned Parenthood of Northern New England. Um, they trained us in how to go and knock on someone's door and talk about abortion. And if you can get people to come outside in their stocking feet in the snow in November and talk to you for 15 or 20 minutes about abortion, you might be onto something. So um, these are kind of the, the steps to deep canvassing, the architecture of it. You just first go in and you're targeting people who don't agree with you. You know that from the voter file. You ask folks about their position and you do it without judgment. You listen for the values that are underneath whatever their position is. You meet them at those shared values. And then you ask questions that invite reflection. You need to model vulnerability so that they trust you and that they will join you in that place of vulnerability and kind of open up. And then ultimately you do share your own position because you want them to know what you think and that someone in their life thinks this way. Finally, you ask them about their position again. What's amazing about this art of deep canvassing is that it's the only proven political persuasion tool. And the reason that it works and that it sticks is because actually it's people persuading themselves. So I wanna tell you a story. Um, when I was in Maine, I was going door to door and I was with another um, kind of 40 something mom. We were in our puffy coats. We were about the least threatening people you could imagine. Um, and we we're knocking door to door and I went to this one door and this woman named Jen opened the door. Um, and she, I, the first thing I did was ask her, what's your stance on abortion on a scale of um, one to 10? How do you feel about abortion? Should it be legal? And she said, I'm about a seven. And I was like, oh, okay, that's good. Um, and I said, well, tell me, why are you a seven instead of a 10, meaning you would, no restrictions, or like a five, you know, some? And she said, well, I mean, I do think people should be able to have an abortion, but ultimately, I don't want them to just be willy-nilly about it. I don't want them to use it as birth control or have tons of abortions. And so I was like, okay. And I was listening to what she was saying, and underneath what she said was the value of responsibility. She wanted to know that it would be used responsibly. But instead of um, fact battling her and telling her how many, what percentage of women actually have multiple abortions, da, 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 I didn't tell her anything. I asked her, do you know anyone who's had an abortion? Yes. Do you know anyone who's had multiple abortions? Long pause. Then she looks at me and she goes, you know, I don't. Do you think that's just one of those like urban myths that they tell us so we're anti-choice? And I was like, I don't know. But I did know. 
still didn't fact battle her. I was like, I don't know. But I didn't want to leave it there because she could then leave and read something and say, well, actually, this many women do have multiple abortions, and so those ones aren't good, right? I didn't want to leave her stigmatizing that. So instead, I asked her, can you imagine a reason why someone might have multiple abortions that you would think was responsible? So I'm meeting her at her value of responsibility. She pauses, and she says, you know, yeah, I mean, like if you were poor and you didn't have, you know, so she, and or if you were in a domestic violence situation, so she starts to talk herself out of the barriers she had imagined, right? Then I, at this point, I'm supposed to meet her with vulnerability. And if I had a story of an abortion, this is where I would share it with her. Um, and so I don't. So what I actually did was told her about the time that I miscarried twins. And I said, when that happened to me, um, the doctor said, we're going to bring you into the hospital and give you um, what is a DNE, which is an abortion procedure, right? But for me, the insurance covered it. The nurses could not have been any nicer. They put a really warm, cozy blanket on me. Everyone was kind. And by the time I left, it was as good a day as it could have been if that was the day I was going to have to have. And she put her arm on my shoulder. And she's like, I'm sorry that happened. And I said, thank you. And and. You know, I was just downtown in Maine and in Portland, and I saw the Planned Parenthood clinic, and there's so many women who are trying to go in to get an abortion, and they're getting screamed at, and there's people holding signs. I said, have you ever seen that? And she's like, yeah, it's horrible. So I said, listen, if a woman decides to have an abortion, and even if it's her second or third one, if she's decided she's going to do it, what do you want her experience to be like? And she said, Jackie, I want it to be like yours. I want her to have dignity, and I want it to be a positive experience. And I was like, okay, Jen, so let me ask you, <laughs> where do you fall on abortion now from a scale of one to 10? Where do you fall? And she's like, I'm a 10. Because I didn't tell her what to think. I didn't tell her facts. I didn't try to teach her or explain to her how she was wrong. I asked her questions that let her work through the barriers that were keeping her from having a progressive stance. And Jen's story is just one of so many stories, even from that day. Two doors down, a woman told me about, she came out, shut the door because her mom was behind her and she didn't want her mom to hear it. She told me about her miscarriage. A couple doors down from that, a woman talked to me about her um, inability to get pregnant. So even though we were out there having an abortion conversation, we were actually talking with women about their lived experience. And they were in the snow, in the cold, for 20 minutes with me having those kinds of conversations. Because ultimately, we are all want belonging. We want connection. We want the chance to be with someone else. And for when given that opportunity, people accept it. So the best outcome from this kind of canvassing is really that connection, that feeling seen and heard, the opportunity for self-reflection, self-learning, and ultimately self-persuasion. Our research shows us that um, Jen really is not alone. Um, I, I want to actually quickly tell you the second part of that story, which is um, now that Jen told me she was a 10 and I had done my job, I said, listen, would you mind calling your senator really quickly and telling him that you support Planned Parenthood um, and that you would um, support um, funding for Planned Parenthood? Planned Parenthood. And she is like, oh, she got so uncomfortable. She's like, oh. And so she takes the, the paper and she reads it and she starts to take my phone to dial and then she hangs up the phone and pushes it back to me. And I was like, what's the matter? And she's like, I don't, I don't, I'm going to mess it up. And I was like, that's okay. It's Saturday. It's a voicemail. Leave your name at the end. If you mess it up, we'll just do it again. She's like, no, no, I'm going to, you're going to think I look stupid. I don't want you to see me mess it up. And so then she said, I'll take it inside and I promise I'll do it. And I was like, Jen, we both know that if I leave here, the chances of you really doing it are pretty slim. And she's like, Jackie, I promise I will do it for you. She went back in the house with the script. And the, that's what I want to talk to you about is like what she was telling me, that fear of looking stupid, the fear of getting it wrong, the fear of messing up is a huge barrier that we're seeing to women's voting now. Um, before I go on to talk about specifically what Galvanize USA is doing around white women's voting, I want to pause and really say to you that you should take away from my talk that the only way for us to win is a both and strategy. We must address voter suppression and turn out of voters of color, and we may need to be funding that and supporting that with everything we have, both because the math requires it and morality requires it. So absolutely this is, should be happening. And we have to do the next part, which is 
figuring out who are the persuadable white women who we can get to understand that their fates are linked with women of color and men of color and vote their, use that political power to advance progress. Galvanize USA is actually the only national organization that's focused on targeting per, uh, the persuadable white women's vote. Um, and honestly, I assumed that there must be others, and I was really just going to give somebody money when I started this thing. But the research I did, I discovered there was no one filling this gap. And so Galvanize USA was created to fill that gap. And we spent 18 months doing research. I wanted to listen, to understand, to go in with humility, to recognize that there's something going on for these gals who aren't using their political power that is holding them back um, from helping to advance progress for all. So I wanted to understand what it was. We did focus groups. We did uh, community listening sessions. We did one-on-one -on -one ethnographic interviews. We did battleground surveys. And what we discovered among registered white women voters was striking. We found that there was a 13 million white women who support issues including choice, gun safety, and climate change, but who are not reliably voting that way because of gendered social and cultural barriers. These gals um, tell us that they that's how they feel. They feel uh, progressive on these issues, but ultimately they have these barriers that are holding them back from voting that way. Um, Mostly what they're telling us in, this, in these interviews is stories of having the um, gendered load for caregiving, taking care of the kids, getting ready for camp, handling lunches, where their husbands have control of the clicker. Um, he's watching Fox News. She feels like all that is is people yelling at each other, and I don't need more people yelling at me in my life. So she's tuning out while he's t listening in. Both men and women think men know more about politics. Um, so in this case, when she knows how she feels, she starts to talk to her husband or her father or her father-in-law about it, and she feels like she can't express or defend her point of view because she no only knows how she feels, and he's got these facts from his news watching. Lots of these guys are also in jobs where um, they have the conservative radio on all day long at work, either in the truck or in the shop, et cetera. So he he's got a lot of facts. Um, and so what we heard from these gals was, and this is among registered white women voters, three quarters prefer to avoid talking politics because they're afraid it will lead to conflict or negative consequences. Often that was about losing a marriage or losing a job. Um, almost, so 48% said they don't feel like they can express or defend their view. 53% said they don't feel like they know enough to talk about politics. One that's not on here that breaks my heart, 49% of registered white moms say that um, when they talk about politics, they feel stupid. Um, and a third of these gals say that um, they don't think anyone around them shares their views. It's that isolation that makes them, and so the cultural um, reasons keep them quiet. They gotta keep the peace in the family. Every focus group I did, someone did this. I'm just trying to keep the peace. If I, someone's gotta pick up my kids from school, they can't be mad at me about who I voted for. I'm keeping the peace. So they won't talk politics. Um, that means that they feel like they're the only one that thinks that, like, that the way they do. They start to lose confidence that they're right the only people talking to them about it are guys who know more than they do. Um, and so they start to lose confidence. And what we see, and this shows up in the polls, is they say they're with us, they're with us, they're with us, and then it collapses before the vote because their confidence collapses. And that lack of confidence is the issue we have to address. So the good news is, in this moment, there, the polarization and the hate and the fighting is actually creating a, a disruption for them. They want peace, and opting out isn't working for them anymore. And I have a whole analysis on white women and peace, and we could talk about that. But for now, um, the good news for us is they want help navigating this moment, and so they're trying to figure out how to, how to work through it. What they don't want is to be yelled at by anybody else, to be told that they're wrong, or to be made more stupid. What they want is essentially a support group to figure out how to vote their values. And that's what we're creating for them. So we've got, um, those last pictures were us in Iowa, um, out there talking to gals at the fair, trying to figure out how, what do they care about and how to support them. We've created a private Facebook group where they get about four servings of dessert for every serving of political vegetables. <laughs> Um, and then we also have living room events that are designed to get folks to build confidence, knowledge, and agency. 
in 2020, our goal is to work with our partners in the states, that's Planned Parenthood, it's domestic violence organizations, it's YWCAs. We're out there working to build the support for these particular gals. Um, and we're going into five states in 2020. And from my perspective, that is just the tip of the iceberg. Because as I said, we are on the, crest, on the cusp of a civil war. And so if we don't do more, um, to really not only make this change in 2020, but start to shift the tide in these states and throughout the sort of Midwest and Rust Belt, we're in for some big trouble. So we'll be working um, in 2020 and beyond. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Milani, so much for having me in the museum. This is a really exciting conversation to be a part of. I'm a little shorter, I think, than the, the first two speakers. So um, so my name is Kim Loper. And um, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, some visuals from the suffrage movement. So the idea that we're celebrating a 100-year anniversary of women owning the um, right to vote is an interesting one, right? We, we now know that this is a fake milestone. Thank you, Adra, for setting that historical stage for us. Um, we know that not all women were included in the 19th Amendment ratification, and um, this legislation around who gets voting rights still continues to this day. So if we're going to have this conversation, um, we really need to look at the way that uh, white women's racism kind of ran through the entirety of the suffrage movement um, and affected the strategy and messaging in its campaigns. So as an artist and a designer, um, I'm particularly interested in the art that women during suffrage were creating and um, the political kind of propaganda posters, um, what these visuals said about the time that they were in and um, it, you know, and who was centralized and who was left out. So in, whoops, um, in London, uh, 1907, the Artist Suffrage League was established to assist with um, preparation for the Mud March, um, which was organized by the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies. And this really ignited um, a body of suffrage propaganda that kind of fled throughout the world. Um, and influenced art made um, during this time. So using traditional craft and, um, craft and arts practices, women were creating banners and illustrated pamphlets, playing cards, posters, um, all to strengthen the visual messaging in their campaign. So you know, heroic realism is an art motif that's generally used within propaganda strategy. And it was popularized um, during this kind of socialist, communist governments in order to control and sway the way that um, emotional visual cues were used um, in, in the audience and using a depiction specifically of figures that were the ideal types or symbols. So if we take a look at um, posters that were really typical and were coming out at that time, um, we see who these heroic realists were, right? White artists were positioning themselves as those central figures uh, worthy of the agenda um, on who to support. So we see that the imagery is really depicting a white woman who is strong but pure, um, and they are embodying um, this kind of ideal to be worshipped. So these two are particularly interesting to me, right, because this left, um, I mean, I just think that's funny, um, but it was a cover of a, a song book, um, and these songs were really used during the time to kind of uh, garner um, collective um, movement on the ground. And then, and then on the right, I think, is particularly interesting because what we see is this kind of upper-class white woman who is distancing, distancing themselves from poor, working-class, convicts and lunatics. So we see white women um, of a particular class really using this divide to help push her agenda. Um, so there are a number of reasons why white women uh, denied black and brown women's voices and it, specific issues within the movement. Some of this was, you know, intentional political strategy. Um, you know, racial exclusion was a way that they could uh, garner support from southern states uh, to ratify the 19th Amendment. Um, but I'm really interested in um, what these sort of things said about the cultural psychological belief um, systems that white women inherit historically and today, um, that we are superior and we don't really need to concern ourselves with anyone else's struggles but our own. 
So this is where my work kind of comes into the conversation. For the last couple years, I've been exploring the manifestations of white women's racism, especially within neoliberal and social justice spaces, through a multimedia project entitled My Race of Prawl. So this is a still from um, a website that is active, and My Race of Prawl is a parody pharmaceutical company that treats the symptoms of racism in white people. <laughs> so as part of this storyline, My Race of Prawl um, manufactures different drugs that treat you know, a variety of these symptoms stemming from the illness, chronic racial anxiety syndrome, or CRAS. So one of the drugs released under this umbrella company is denylium. So denylium links the racial anxiety in white women to the development of wrinkles. So the intention of this project um, is to explore this idea that if white women in power beca began to acknowledge more honest honestly our perpetration in systems of violence, that we would most likely do three things. One, we would center ourselves in the conversation, we would center ourselves and our guilt in the conversation around justice. We would, two, victimize ourselves in the narrative. And three, under capitalism, we would find a way to profit from it. Um, so I use this word if lightly because honestly, I think in many ways this dystopian reality kind of already exists, right? Um, it existed during the suffrage movement in the 1920s, and um, 100 years later, honestly, I think it shows up in a lot of ways today. Um, but I really wanted to play around in this satirical world um, using a collectively understood branding strategy um, as a way to hold up kind of a, a mirror um, to ourselves and the irony that if people in power were to explicitly acknowledge our complicity within systems of um, systems of oppression, that we would only do it through motivations of self-interest. And additionally, that, um, you know, that white women might only be interested in curing our racism if there is a direct and um, superficial benefit like clear skin. So this last layer, I think, is important to tap into um, because it because it, um, because it explores this idea that there really is no cure, that there is only the short-term management of symptoms of the illness, and that white people are not actually invested in dismantling race-based systems of power because there's always an incentive for us to maintain it, and in this case, and most cases, it's economic. So I've been exploring this universe um, through a variety of mediums. There is a digital campaign which is running on social media and through a website. Um, so this is some, some swag, some denylium swag. I have some if you want me to send you some. Get on the mailing list. Um, so this is some collateral um, that exists on the social media page. And so, you know, I'm really trying to tap into these archetypes that I, I feel like exist and are maybe even reflective in myself, right? In, in, you know, we see them in nonprofit spaces, we see them in movement spaces, they're an archetype that exists everywhere in ourselves. Um, there is a, there's a film, there's a short film that we did that was on the, um, it's online and uh, hit the, um, the film uh, circuit, the festival circuit. And then in, and then in my opinion, the most interesting of these are this interactive performance spaces that I set up where I um, create an installation that kind of feels like a vending pop-up or a doctor's office, and I perform as your local pharmaceutical rep, um, and I, I raise awareness about the illness and promote the drug. So here is um, you know, a faux doctor's office where we, um, we tested people um, through some kind of um, just like, well, we tested people in a lot of ways. Um, and folks would come in, they would take these tests, we would screen them through, um, you know, multiple choice, um, we would do tongue tests, I mean, it was all fabricated, right? And then um, we, would, we would give out these, um, these pills. So this is Dr. Um, Goldman. <laughs> um, I've done pop-ups at um, universities, um, and these are a little, these are more interesting because people are really not expecting um, 
they're not expecting the content and sometimes it takes a while for people to understand what's happening and and sometimes people s still don't and and i would have a lot of interactions where um folks were really some folks thought that it was real and were just kind of minds blown that this is now an illness that we have to address So I want to be clear that I don't think that this art serves the purpose of activism in and of itself. I think the goal was to use humor as a way to invite white people into, especially white women, into a kind of low-risk co-learning space where we could dialogue and play through a process of self-reflection around our own internalized white supremacy and the baggage that we bring into everyday spaces. That even when we, white women, think we're, think we're woke, think that we're doing good work, um, that we're fighting the good fight, that there's most likely some huge blind spots that we um, not only haven't acknowledged well, but are actually incredibly violent. So I'm using these visual cues in her heroic realism to kind of satirize what white women do best, um, blindly promoting our own narrative with no critical analysis on how we fit into a bigger interconnected context. Um, so this project really is a work in progress, and it continues to grow and evolve. And I recognize now that it's not perfect, um, but it has been a learning tool for me. Um, and there's two utilities uh, that I want to talk about. One is that it helped me collect kind of a set of data around where white women were, are, um, in thinking and talking about these things. So one, but one major f reflection and critique I have is that I acknowledge the way that it invites kind of white liberal progressives into a space where we're able to position ourselves as better than um, those racist white people over there who have wrinkles, right? And I think that this is actually, um, Jackie was touching on this, that this is actually a pro problematic um, tool, right, if we're thinking about how to organize people and create kind of broader bases for the movement. Um, that we need to go back into our home spaces and um, stop disaffiliating from those cultural roots. And I, too, I think it's really led me into a shift in my, my own kind of political commitment um, and the importance of doing this kind of race conscious organizing, specifically w within white communities. So that's kind of what I'm thinking about as my next steps. I don't have all the answers, um, but I am kind of figuring out now how to bring some of these tenants that were really successful out of the gallery space, out of liberal spaces, and into, you know, for example, poor and working class white communities during this next um, election uh, cycle. So, if we can honestly reflect on this 100-year kind of fake milestone, we give ourselves the opportunity to engage in social change that is collaborative and moves in solidarity with those who are most affected by uh, systems of oppression. So, if white women um, care about change like we say we do, um, we must align ourselves with anti-racist politi political action led by black and brown work, um, and working class people in a way that decenters ourselves. And that most likely means holding up a mirror to ourselves first. Thank you. Good evening. I think we crossed over into the evening now. I can say it, even though it's dark at three o'clock. Um, I'm Alexandra Bell. Um, I'm going to. I'm an artist, visual artist. Um, I'm going to talk a bit. It's a, this is a tough follow, though, I must admit. Um, you, should, you should wheat paste those. I would love to like, get these up on the wall. Um, I just feel like it would be so great to run into that in the street. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about, not going to talk specifically about voting, but I am going to talk a bit about um, images and media and the news and how, uh, in many ways, it does feed the way we think about the world and, consequently, how we, how we vote. Um, so I'm going to start a bit, but before I do, I want to get this quote in y'all's brains, right? So um, we have kind of dinner later, and hopefully we'll be able to kind of tease out some more. Um, the power of the media lies not only in their ability to reflect the dominant racial ideology, but in their capacity to define it in the first place. Um, I first encountered this quote as an undergraduate, and then and at the time, it's, you, know, you, you know when you hear something, you're like, That's a, that means something really important, but you don't know what it, what it means, the weight of it just yet. Um, and then 
you know, nine years later in grad school as a journalist, this made a lot of sense to me. Um, I started journalism school at Columbia in 2011, and in that course, I had to take um, a class called Writing and Reporting. And this is kind of the foundational journalism course. You, we would read three papers um, a day, unfortunately. <laughs> um, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Daily News. And the point of this particular exercise was to really get a sense of how different um, media organizations reported similar topics. I want to say at this time, I was really kind of, one, just kind of burdened by the news, but also really curious as to why some stories felt like they were factual, but they weren't true. Um, and not really knowing how to pose this set of questions to um, my professor. And so we kind of, unfortunately, fast forward this is from 2014, but unfortunately, fast forward to 2016, um, Alton Sterling was killed, and Philando Castile was, was killed, and my friends and I started this really unfortunate kind of morbid tradition of meeting for drinks every time there was a police killing. And we were at the bar the, the night of Alton Sterling's um, murder, which was July 5th, and uh, we were there to talk to a friend who had actually seen, seen footage of him dying accidentally, right? And so she was trying to process this and trying to process how the news kind of brought her this information unexpectedly. And we kind of closed the bar. We're leaving, it's 3 a.m., 2 a.m. We're standing on the corner and we open our phones to kind of a Facebook feed. And it's Philando Castile, but we don't really understand what we're watching, so we all go home. Um, and then, of course, we all wake up to a new hashtag. Um, and then maybe a month or so later, there was Corinne Gaines, a woman in... Baltimore who was killed in her home by police. And we're meeting and we're talking about this and one of the things, you know, everyone has their opinions about how this could have been avoided. And I'm really curious about this particular article in the Washington Post that says, um, Corinne Gaines cradling child and shotgun is fatally shot by police. And somebody said, wasn't she in her home? And I was like, yeah, that might be a good thing to put in the headline. Not that this headline is wrong, but I felt that if that information were there, it frames the story in a different way. And so now I have the answer to this particular question around kind of facts and truth. So I was like, you know what? This reminds me of a Michael Brown article in the New York Times from 2014, which is the bottom part of that paper there. I'm gonna zoom in here. And so I said, you know, I wonder if there's a way to engage with or kind of tinker with the news that will maybe reveal something else about what I think is going on. Not a correction so much, but maybe to reveal a perspective. Um, and so Counter Narratives was kind of born with this particular work here. Um, Michael Brown in 2014 was shot and killed by Darren Wilson, Officer Darren Wilson. This was the article that ran in the New York Times. Um, two lives at Crossroads in Ferguson. And on the, um, a low profile officer with unsettled early days and on the other side a teenager grappling with the problems and promise. There's a story about Michael Brown and they were juxtaposed in the paper. And so I said, you know, I think this is probably an unfair framework, right? This, these, you have a cop and you have a kid and something about this suggests a particular kind of, kind of equality of subjects that I don't think is actually fairly communicated here. And so what way can I try to highlight this particular problem and really get and tease out what some of the dangers and maybe pitfalls of objectivity may be in news, right? You can't actually treat all subjects the same. Um, and so here you can see I kind of tinkered with the language. Crossroads in Ferguson and the one, the Darren Wilson article became a profile officer. The Michael Brown article became a teenager with promise. So ultimately I decided to take out all of the information. It's not because it wasn't wasn't correct, but I really wanted to leave kind of the bare bones. Um, sorry, the text isn't coming up really clearly on the screen. Um, but on the left-hand side, it says, a profile officer, Darren Wilson, fatally shot an unarmed black teenager named Michael Brown. And on the other side, it says, a teenager with promise, Michael Brown Jr., his shooting death by Darren Wilson, a white police officer. So I just wanted to leave the bare bones of the information. And then I changed it to a teenager with promise. At the time, there was a lot of um, grappling with 
Michael Brown as a grown man, and he was a, he was a Hulk, and you know Darren Wilson described him also as a demon, um, and so I I decided to I wanted to to kind of get at the nostalgia of um, Michael Brown, and also really highlight his age um, as an 18 year old, because I think a lot of people really kind of lost sight of that. And the article did as well. It, it discussed things such as the kind of music that he rapped, that he used profane of profane language, um, and of course these. These are facts, right? They may be facts, um, but there's a problematic framework there that suggests maybe he wasn't a victim, and I had a problem with that. Um, and so I started wheat pasting them. Here is one that I put up. This one is um, each panel is six feet by eight feet. Um, this is an installation that I did at MoMA PS1 in New York. Um, the size of these works are meant to invite people to engage and critique together, right? Part of one of the things that happens with the news is that it's a kind of individual and kind of isolating experience in a way. And I was hoping that by making these works large scale, I could get people to have discussions about topics maybe they wouldn't encounter or, or be open to discussing in the first place. So that's the first work of the counter narrative series. So this is an odd one to explain it, but if I go back to this one, the, the panel on the left side is kind of the original New York Times articles with my edits and changes, and then the right-hand side is the redo. And so you'll see the before and after more in the next work. This one here, um, zoom in at the bottom. This one's about the Ryan Lochte sc scandal. It says here, accused of fabricating robbery, swimmers fuel tension in Brazil. And then if you look at the photo, it doesn't really look like Ryan Lochte, right? And you know, this is another fact versus truth, right? Because in all fairness, this is actually another article embedded in underneath this article. But the juxtaposition is very problematic. Um, and so in my version, I mark it up, you know, change the, change the headline, remove the photo, redo caption, replace picture with swimmers. And then this is the redo. And the headline, Rio gas station footage reveals white American swimmers were offenders. Now, um, some of what I like to do in the work as well is kind of draw on history to make inferences, right? And so in this particular work, I use white American in part because I think um, there's an assumption that whiteness equals Americanness automatically. And so I thought the hyphen was important. But also in, um, 1947, Robert B. Leeser wrote the article, Churchman Sees Peril in Negro Headlines, where he examined one newspaper for an entire month, finding that 39 crime stories involving blacks, the word Negro or Negroes, were used in headline 34 times. Out of the 133 crime and court stories involving white suspects, no race was mentioned at all. Right, so there's a pairing there that's undeniable. This is the work is installed. Um, this is about seven feet high and 14 feet across. And this is what it looks like at a distance. So I'm gonna, one more from the series. Um, this one's Gavin McGinnis's path from hipster to far right firebrand. Gavin McGinnis is the founder of the Proud Boys, kind of a pro-white, white nationalist organization. Um, I, I pulled this article because, and this is actually a full page article, but just for visual sake, I had to kind of crop it in half. Um, I found it really interesting that firebrand was the word that was used. Now, I don't think the newspaper has a responsibility to vilify, to take very strong opinions about subjects, but I'm really interested in sometimes how the New York Times is a very kind of soft hand when it comes to white supremacy. Um, even the photo to me is too passive. I think if you're gonna write up full page article in color, well this one was probably in color, about um, a figure, I, I need to see something more dominant than this photo be used. So I changed it. Gavin McGinnis from Vice Media to Far Right Gang Leader. And all of the words used in this headline were actually extracted from the article. So at some point, the Times used these terms to talk about what he did. So I think there's, you know, you. They're both right, it's just a perspective, right? Um, and my hope is that you, know, you, you leave each of the works with a new tool. You know, in the second work, um, the issue there is kind of of image. You, know, you should ask yourself, does this photo belong? Um, 
and also the headline. And here as well, the question is, is this headline appropriate? Are we using language strong enough to, to get the viewer to kind of understand the implications of this particular character? Um, and I think the, the times kind of let us down there. Uh, while the counter narrative series is kind of primarily in some ways um, about images, um, the work here, which is from my series, No Humans Involved After Sylvia Winter, which examines the daily news coverage of the Central Park Five case, this is about language. Um, and I'm very interested um, in how racist and coded language inform and shape our view of black and brown people. Um, and I'm I'm particularly concerned with how racist frameworks predetermines inequality and enables social hierarchies. Um, this is, the, this is um, Friday, April 21st, 1989. It's the front page. And the first print, it's the first print of 20 in the series. It's also the first article reported by the Daily News on what will become known widely as the Central Park Jogger case. So I, her, uh, Trisha Miley, the um, victim of the Central Park 5K, um, was was raped probably two days before. This is the opening article <laughs> for anyone reading about this case. Um, the way the series works is um, I do a series of screen prints over a photo litho where I highlight um, words. And the title of the series, No Humans Involved, references Sylvia Winter's 1994 open letter, um, No Humans Involved, or NHI, the unofficial acronym that the Los Angeles law enforcement used to classify cases involving black men and other members of undesirable communities, um, such as prostitutes and gang members. This is the series, is, um, it was in the Whitney Biennial. This is uh, 20 prints across. Um, it starts with a wolf, wolf pack's prey image and it ends with the, the kind of infamous Trump ad. Um, I, hate to, I hate to end with this guy. <laughs> um, but I do think that it's really important, especially as we, we you know, get ready to sit down and talk, to really think about kind of power in media and who gets to kind of dictate and talk through um, these sources, right, and whose voices are prioritized and what viewpoints make it out there. Um, and so I want us to, you know, as we sit down and when we talk later tonight to really think about these and keep that quote in your mind. We can talk about some, some more. That's it? Yeah, that's last night. <laughs>